This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is episode 18 of the Cornell Turf Show this year. Um, our guest today is Matt Elmore from Rutgers. You'll remember Matt from uh, previous seasons coming on to, to chat weeds. Uh, as always, we're never sure where you're going to lead us here, Frank, and, and what we're going to get into today. But for our live audience, uh, you know, you, you've always got the, the Q&A section, so throw throw questions at us whenever you see fit. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Frank, for our, our little re weather review this week. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, we weren't, we didn't have our show yesterday. We were out in the field uh, walking around golf courses. And, you know, just for other listeners and viewers uh, of the video or live, um, you know, we, I, I think there's opportunities for us to walk around outside and, and learn in a very, you uh, low stress, uh, no registration, show up, we'll start talking, we can walk around. We had a wonderful day yesterday out at uh, the links at Greystone uh, with Tim Hahn, and it was a good golf group. So today, we're talking lawns. And you know, the, the, the funny thing about this conversation over the last several years is, you know, I have a weed scientist on and that used to be all right, control, control, control. And now we're having this broader discussion about uh, the flowering lawn. So I know that's going to be part of our conversation today. That's the wild card for today, Matt. But we're going to, we're going to, we got some more traditional things, more like what Carl's dog is doing to his backyard. Uh, this, I don't even think your backyard looks this good, does it? Carl? Oh, I, w I would wish for this, Frank. <laughs> That's right. But you can see the bombs this little guy's been dropping uh, through the wintertime. And, you know, being so far behind as we're going to talk about in a minute, this slug of nitrogen really shows up and shows you how you can overcome some of these things if you're willing to do fertilize the way we did back in the 60s, you know, at 10 pounds of nitrogen uh, on a lawn per thousand square feet. So, all right, Carl, here's your stat. I know you're going flowering lawns. What are we talking about? Yeah, and uh, I thought it was it was apropos today. You know, we, we talk about weeds, and, and like you said, Frank, we're always controlling them. Uh, I think this study from Minnesota is is maybe um, quantifying the shift in, in the American public and and how they uh, value pollinators, right? So pollinator lawns, common there's you can find lawn mixes now in in the big box stores that that have white clover, self heal, um, some of these flowering weeds that the pollinators can forage on and and gives them. Uh, some food. So, so these folks in Minnesota went around to a bunch of neighborhood parks. Um, they had some some pollinator lawns set up, and they asked people, you know, what do you think of pollinator lawns? Do you support these? Uh, and, and overwhelmingly, people said they did. And then they would follow up and say, you know, okay, there's going to be more pollinators. That's a, a higher likelihood of getting stung by a pollinator. Do you still support uh, these these areas, even when uh, you may get more likely to get stung? even then 95% of people they surveyed uh, were in support. So I think that's kind of uh, showing you where we're moving towards. Um, you, you can buy pollinator mixes, you can, you can plant those things. Uh, this picture over here is, is my lawn, which was not planted. And that's just a uh, wild violet and dandelion and, and the pollinators like that. I'm a, again, as I've, I've documented, I'm a lazy homeowner. So this is kind of uh, born out of my laziness and not wanting to mow more than 10 times a year. Um, but but I can feel good that there's uh, there's foraging habitat for the pollinators, so so we're seeing more of that for sure. Yeah, and Carl, I'll tell you, I was in Madison, you know, Madison, Wisconsin, the Ithaca of the Midwest, if you will, um, and I would say uh, thirty five percent of the lawns looked exactly like this. Um, you know, there's not enormous diversity in a lot of lawns. It's it's mm -hmm. dandelion. These are violets, right? The violets mm -hmm. are. Uh, really in bloom. You might see some ground ivy here and there uh, coming in, going in different places. But um, this, you know, I, saw, I don't know where everybody's going with this, but for sure, the season is very far behind. Uh, not everybody's mowed further north. The dry conditions that I'm going to talk about in a second has slowed a lot of things, but not necessarily uh, what we would call weeds, right? So let's look at the weather. And, and Matt, I got some questions for you as we get into the weather a little bit, particularly uh, when we talk about dandelion control. But overall, we'll start with moisture. That's a pretty big story. You can see the really strong gradient. It's much drier to the north. We're at 50 to 75 percent of normal. Once you get north of the Pennsylvania border up to Hudson Valley, Pioneer Valley, and especially along the New England coast and the eastern end of Long Island. And you can see already in the drought monitor, some of these places are starting to show up as, as getting pretty dry. And that's, 
in addition to the cooler weather, um, you know, slowing down normal growth. Now, the other thing you notice, and this was a wow, we're starting to see ET values above an inch. Here we are in the end of May. So the sun's got another six weeks or so to get the peak height in the sky where where ET values will be really high. So you're probably seeing a lot of things drying out. And of course, this is going to have a big effect on, uh, on, on, on turf growth moving forward. Now, um, last week, you can see this wall that got built right across Pennsylvania and across the northern, uh, you know, central Massachusetts area where there was very little rainfall to the north. And as much as two inches, probably where you are, Matt, uh, you got a dump uh, last week. And so looking forward, again, everybody for the next day or two is going to get dry. And then it looks like we're moving into a showery period for the weekend. But um, no real strong patterns here. Our, our climatologist was indicating on Thursday that it's about a 50-50, how the rainfall is going to go. He's going to call it, he was calling it, overall less than a half an inch uh, region wide. So we're not expecting to see uh, widespread heavy rainfall like we did the last couple of weeks. So the roller coaster uh, continues. This doesn't have some of the high temperatures um, that we experience later in the week, particularly in the north. Uh, and overall, we still finished a little bit below normal and only slightly above normal. And that's because we started out cool before the heat came uh, mid last week. Now, it looks like, again, we're going to be normal temperatures, maybe a couple of spikes uh, over the weekend while the showers are coming through. But overall, a normal, you know, 40 to 50s for lows, 60 to 70s for highs. Uh, for the week forward, uh, temperature wise. So the degree days now is where the weed story begins to emerge because you look at degree days over the last week, you see still less than 20 uh, in the northern part of the region. And you go to the south where it's been a little bit warmer, you can see as much as 50 to 60, right? So that's still barely 10 degrees a day that's being accumulated. And you look at the difference from normal since the growing season started as we mark it March 15th, we still have a majority of the Northeast well behind normal, uh, as much as two weeks when you get into the northern areas, uh, but at higher elevations, a little, a little further behind. And as you get around the New York metropolitan area, a little bit closer to normal, the stats are that from last year, we're about two weeks behind and about one week behind in general, the 30 year normal. So Matt, the dandelions are starting to bloom. This mm -hmm. is when everybody wants to treat them. Just a, a ground check with you on this. Oh, I wanted to introduce you. Did you know you had a new title now? We don't <laughs> call you a weed scientist anymore. We've decided to call these plants incidental flowering plants, not weeds. We uh -oh. feel that's a little too harsh on these plants that their virtue hasn't been realized yet. So we're going like to leave you at this. How do you like this Purdue model? This is really right. To be sure, it's a narrow 2,4-D dandelion spring. Have you played around with this at all? I know you worked with Braz. I don't know if you guys played around with this, but this was developed back in the Riker Throssel days. And we put it up there as a guideline, but I want to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely a good guideline. Um, I think the other thing to be aware of or to at least be monitoring is, you know, the flowering. Um, sometimes control can be a little bit lower at flowering, but in general, too, you know, dandelions are, if you want to control them, are pretty easily controlled with, with you know, your 2,4-D type products. Um, I think the key is, you know, looking at a map like this where, hey, is it too early right now? Um, and not applying when it's too early. So, you know, for if you get up into New England, it's still a little bit early. Uh, right now here, we're at the, I guess you'd call puffball stage. Um, so it's, you know, getting to be a good window for us to treat based so on that like and also based out on- out of the flowering window, Matt. Yeah, there's some other work that shows that, you know, again, they can be a little bit tougher to control at flowering, but, you know, practically speaking, that's a little bit tough to do, right? I mean- whenever everyone's making these applications, they're in the springtime, you know, they're flowering. And I think the key thing to remember is that dandelions are relatively easy to control with 
you know, your typical 2,4-D products. Okay, so. so just getting it, you know, maybe avoid, and the other reason to avoid flowering is we're talking about spraying the pollinators, right? Yeah, if you, yeah, if you want to wait right now, I mean, the dandelions have done most of their flowering. So, you know, the pollinators have enjoyed them. And I guess now they're, it's time to move on to something else. So uh, if you want to go ahead and spray those dandelions, I guess, right, you've, you've you know, you, you're, uh, you've given the pollinators the chance, right? right. Of course, right. it's a perennial. So next year's crop won't be as strong if you spray them this year. I guess that's one thing to keep in mind. If that's the goal of your of your, you know, lawn, sports field management, whatever it is. I mean, yeah, they do reestablish from seed, but, you know, they are perennials, so. Right, and, and, and again, that's why we tell people, this ain't the time. <laughs> the time yeah. is the fall, right? right? I mean, that's the ideal time. The problem is people see them now. Yeah, right? yeah, right. So they want to treat them. So you can get more thorough control uh, of, the, of, of the bigger plants, especially, right? By yeah. treating later in the season and then, preventing that flowering potentially from occurring for sure and we've done work here um even into november we've gotten good control december was too late um but you know that window in the fall is pretty large yeah and and, uh, and deep control so so listen let's move on to the next patch of weeds that are then going to be impacted by soil temperature which you can see you know we had in the 60s like a month ago and yeah. it's like we pushed pause and it would go up for a few days and then down well when we would be record lows. And it looks like now almost everybody's in the 50s. Some have crept into the low 60s, which starts to say, OK, what about crabgrass germination and my pre? So, you know, I pulled the GDD prediction uh, of this and it looks like germination is actively underway where you are. Uh, Matt, wh what do you say? How, how do you like? I mean, I think the forsythias are, are green yeah. now, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're long past that. Um, we're getting rhododendron starting to bloom now. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I agree with that map. We've already seen crabgrass emergence in some of the thinner areas, you know, um, where the sunlight's going to heat up that soil a little bit quicker. That's been probably about two or three weeks ago. But then the crabgrass that came up you know, two or three weeks ago, just kind of sitting there and wondering, maybe I, maybe I came up a little bit early. Um, I, I think we're going to get a big flush of germination when we get this warm up next week. And now that we've got wet soils, um, you know, I think this map's looking looking pretty good here. Okay. So, all right, yeah, all right. Well, we all haven't right. had our big flush yet, but but for sure the pre should be out by now and in, yeah. in this region and and uh, yeah. Right, and you know me, I've been trying to challenge the pre-emergent idea for a really long time, right? The blanket applications that, you know, we do. So we've been playing around, as you know, yeah. with some alternatives and it started out with some impact of traffic uh, on crabgrass, right? This is without the availability of pre-emergent herbicides that this golf course doesn't have. Um, we found uh, some from uh, Jim Watson back in the 50s. Chris Sitko uh, uncovered this publication that indicated that uh, under heavy compaction, crabgrass was not germinating as well. Uh, this was one of the only reports uh, I think I've ever seen of this uh, where heavy compaction suppressed crabgrass germination. So, um, we started playing around with this um, a couple of years ago during the pandemic. We were locked up, so we started driving back and forth on our plots. Uh, this is rolling two times a day, five days a week with a golf cart, and uh, obviously too light a roller because the, the tires did most of the work here. And this is a picture, Matt, we took uh, 12 months after we stopped the treatments. So this, you know, we stopped the treatments in the fall of the previous year, and this is right around August, a year later. Now, um, you look close and you can see we get much less uh, crabgrass there. And then when Chris Sitko was working out at the vineyard last year, uh, he took a, an area and just started rolling it every day, uh, six days a week. Looks like we sprayed it, right? This was... <laughs> really uh, quite impressive in ways that we don't entirely understand uh, yet, other than what Watson showed. Um, and the other thing we've done, Matt, and I know you've played around with this too, but these are plots from Chris's work last year where he sprayed Fiesta at full rate 
early post one to five leaf crabgrass on a bluegrass practice tee, sandy soils, and it was dry right after he made a single application. So you're looking at an August picture from a single application made in June. So this is driving me crazy now, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> you know, trying know, to put all yeah. this together. So right. let's start with just a general conversation about this, this craziness that we're seeing and what your alternative work has started to bear out or not for crabgrass control. Yeah, well, the rolling uh, work is really interesting and all that compaction stuff. We're planning to start some work this year looking at that with goose grass. We have the plots laid out and everything. Um, and then we've also been looking at Fiesta as well and seen similar things where that early post-emergence timing seems to be pretty good. So for us, that's you know June. Um, we get into July. And there's a little too much phytotoxicity with that application. Mm. Um, and then pre-emergence, we have not seen it work well as a true pre. So just like you uh, and Chris up there, you know, we're seeing similar things. And it's not as much control as we get from synthetic products. But the whole idea is we're trying to find an alternative and build an integrated program. So That's right. um, these two things, you know, layered together look like they could be pretty effective and potentially, you know, especially if you think about the fact that we're already doing a lot of rolling anyway on some of these areas. That's right. Um, and maybe we'll get people out rolling the, their customers' lawns yeah. uh, at certain times of the year, right? Or going out with this. Now, now um, uh, I want to keep going because this theme isn't over, right? So, you know, every year we scientists uh, do their survey, right? And yeah. we get our, this is our turf grass, uh, most common and most troublesome. And I know you probably would agree with, uh, almost all of these, although the ones that worry me are, uh, nuts edge and probably Kylinga for you. Um, but I want to add to this cause you got me thinking about this a while ago, right? It, you made a statement that maybe, we're starting to see plants elude our traditional pre-strategies. Here is on the left, the Japanese silk grass that you said, I think you said it germinated, what, six weeks ago, F five weeks yeah. ago? Yeah, we, um, I'd have to check this year. I believe it was, it was we actually have pre-emergence trials now out for silk grass and we put them out in mid-March. Ah, so I, I believe it was early April this year. It's been a little cool. Right. I'm not exactly sure, though. I have to, to check. But yeah, much earlier, up to a month earlier. Right. Maybe six year, weeks if we get a warm year. You know, this year has been really steady. Some years we get these wild fluctuations where it gets up to, you know, 75 degrees in March for three days. And that'll trigger a lot of these weeds to, you know, like stilt grass to germinate. So, yeah, we're we're uh, I agree that there's, you know, there's certain species finding a niche in our holes in our strategy. <laughs> So when, you, when I think we're a little bit scared about this um, stilt grass on one level, we'll get the goose grass in a second, but the stilt grass, a, a C4, yeah. warm season plant with shade tolerance. That's a little bit concerning from uh, when you think of woodline edges and this is a picture of a shady lawn. Uh, typically you wouldn't go out early with a pre and I'm thinking, okay, well, what if they're trying to get stilt grass and crabgrass? If they put their crabgrass material out in March to get stilt grass and get that crabgrass, are they going to have to go out with another pre to get the goose grass? That's going to come later, Matt. So is this going to mean we need two pre's? Or do you see I can find one pre to get all three of these? Well, I think it's a good opportunity to use the split applications, split up, split application program, you know, making two apps, but taking that total active ingredient and dividing it into two. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, I think it's an opportunity is to, I mean, I, it depends on your business model, but try to get more sp site specific management because I don't think we're going to see goose grass in the same place as we'll see stilt grass. I some anecdotally, what we've seen is stillgrass is kind of like crabgrass. It doesn't really like those high traffic areas. Whereas goosegrass, that's really mostly where it's competitive. It's not going to be competitive in these low traffic areas. 
you know, in our goose grass plots at the farm where we don't traffic them, we pretty much, ha we have to spray the crabgrass out. Otherwise the crabgrass will just choke out the goose grass. Wow. So when you shift and you get these, you know, highly compacted areas, you almost need to have a separate program for that maybe as compared to these low traffic areas where you might get still grass and crabgrass. Again, that's one potential option that doesn't fit every, every business model. But yeah, I agree our, our pre, you know, the window where we need a pre-emergent out there is probably a little bit larger if we've got. So can, can you talk species. a little bit more about split apps? You're not. Are you talking two full rate apps, or you're talking find the rate? I mean, do a, do a lot of the pre's we would be using again? Let's review them. Maybe pendimethalin, prodiamine, dithiapyr. Those would be the big ones, right? That you would normally see used in the lawn landscape. Maybe team, if but that's not very long lived. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, are, 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 so, so are we going to be able to get these? How are we going to split these apps? Yeah, I mean, we've done some work looking at applications even in February for crabgrass control, which would be a good timing for stiltgrass as well. Hmm. And when you apply in February, uh, late February, as soon as the soil thaws out, you get less control from a single app and good, you know, as much control as you would from a normally timed app if you apply in February and then again in mid June. And, and that's splitting the taking the full rate and splitting it in two. So we're not doing two full rate apps. Okay. We're taking the high rate, which for dimension is half a pound, for diamine a pound of active again. So yeah. it depends on the product. And then pentamethylin three pounds. So we're taking that. We're either putting it out in one shot in February, which again is going to cover stilt grass, but it kind of runs out of gas for crabgrass. But if you take that three pounds, let's say, of pentamethylin, split it into two apps, one in February or early March for stilt grass control, and then you come back again in late May, early June, um, that worked well for crabgrass control, again, compared to single apps. So oh, this is great. This is um, great. Now, but once I do that, am I done? being able to patch seed or any overseeding and what the, if like a lot of companies sell aeration in the spring yeah for what the spring your you're not going to be able to see yeah you're not going to be able to see it in the spring um if you're aerating in the spring i'm but based on some of the work that was done at michigan state in the 80s and all that and some of the work we've done recently if you've got good turf or if the compaction the soil is compromising the ability of the turf to grow I wouldn't be afraid to aerate even if you've applied a pre. Um, the way that the herbicide moves in the soil, wouldn't say moves, but you know, kind of equilibrates in the soil. Yeah. You're not really, it's not like the, the barrier theory and punching a hole in that is maybe a little bit oversimplified. That's right. Um, I think it's a good way to think about it, but I wouldn't worry about you know breaking that barrier. It, yeah, it, no, because I you know, I always used to say it stays resident, it just yeah. you know, just puts up shop. Yeah, for, exactly. For about ten to twelve weeks, uh, yeah. uh, you know, and remains in some uh, active form. So, listen, let me keep going because yeah. I, I got two more to go here, and one is this week. Nut, nut sedge. Yeah. Are we ever going to be able to actually completely control this? Because I'm worried this thing, which is common and keeps bubbling up, and we've only got one line of products in the Northeast. Uh, this thing is going to be uncontrollable soon. What are your thoughts on this? Nut sedge control. Yeah. Um, I, it's very difficult to control, especially when we have these wet years. I mean, last year, we've had a lot of years now where we haven't really had uh, the dry periods, and that helps. Um, we've had a lot of warm temperatures that thins out turf late in the summer, which, you know, all that work recently out of Nebraska shows how much more competitive this weed is in a thin stand of turf. So late in the summer, I think the thing with this one is, you know, it's going to be a multi-year strategy, whatever you need to do, uh, because those tubers it produces underground are just so persistent. So we've so been what's looking the best at earlier program applications. For What's the yeah. best program for a couple of year control? How do I yeah, get I think looking at, it's going to be a multiple, multiple application program and, and almost knowing where it was the year before. So you can make that application relatively early and then make another one, you know, six to eight weeks later. So I'm talking something maybe even early June, um, make an application of, you know, your halosulfuron or your pyrimisulfan 
um, or your Mazda Sulfur onto a Solero, Sedgehammer, Vexus. One Some of those. those we don't have in New York, I don't think. Right. Yeah, you have Halo Sulfur on. That's it. That's it. Yeah, and you don't even have Sulfentrazone, which no. is the alternative mode of action. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it's more challenging for you in New York where you've only got Halo Sulfur on. So you but, like two apps, yeah. uh, six weeks apart, starting early June. Yeah, yeah, as soon as you can see it. Because it starts to produce tubers, you know, just four to six weeks after you see those shoots. So it's setting next year's crop, you know, not too long after those come up. So, and those tubers can persist for several years. So that's why, you know, just like crabgrass, you know, you need to be, you need to kind of know what's in the seed bank or you need to know what tubers are in the soil. It's going to take a long time to really get it under control. Um, what about some, the addition of uh, a methylated seed oil or a crop seed uh, oil? Yeah, uh, what do you critical. like about that? Yeah, NIS, non-ionic surfactant for a halo sulfuron is really critical. You know, you, you could potentially double your herbicide e efficacy just by adding that surfactant. That's a key thing. I think a lot of people don't know or, you know, it's on the label, but, there, you know, there's a million things. Why don't they, label, okay. So. <laughs> this has been true about products with, since Bassagran. Bassagran worked better when you put methylated seed oil in it. Why don't they just put that stuff in the herbicide? Yeah, I don't completely understand why they don't either. I don't know if it's, I think it's difficult to formulate it in there sometimes. And, you, you know, I've, I've heard various answers to that question. I'm not, I'm not don't know that I, I don't know. I guess All right. it would be All nice. Right. Well, listen, we're going to wrap this up with the hardest question. All right. How do I manage quote unquote weeds in a flowering lawn? It's a million dollar question. I mean, I, I don't think we have a lot of good answers. I don't know about you. I think it's going to come down to, you know, you're not going to be spraying herbicides. That's for sure. At least not post-emergence herbicides, broadly herbicides. Um, you're not going to blanket. I think what I would say is you're moving to a complete spot treatment now yeah. because the diversity of plant material you have um, is is going to restrict. I mean, you can't keep one broadleaf. Well, here's the thing. Let's take on clover law. Let's say people just went the simple route out of the gate and went clover. The yeah. first thing I tell them is, just buy something with 2,4-D in it because 2,4-D doesn't control clover. You can get some of those other plants out of there. That's a simple yeah. way to approach it, isn't it, Matt? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's the simplest version. If you do still want some control over the species that are in there, for sure. It'll it'll suppress clover a little bit. So I'd like we talked about with dandelion, wait till it's past that flowering stage, which comes, you know, in a couple of weeks. But yeah, it's not going to, 2,4-D won't kill clover, so at least not if applied properly. All right, Carl, we got any questions from the live audience? Uh, just, just a note from Ben Polymer, who said anecdotally, uh, he sees more goosegrass than, than crabgrass in his highly compacted sports fields. Um, so, so I think that tracks with some things we've seen. I, I think the comment I, I, I'll make, Frank, is, is we're talking about different weeds and different control strategies. You may need different products. Uh, and, and it may sound like um, even if you don't have a pollinator lawn, if you don't want to use a whole lot of chemicals, if you've got all these different weeds, some in the shade, some out in the open, okay, I'm spraying five, four, three herbicide applications. Is that going to be bad? I think to Matt's point, if you're spot specific, you know, if you're not treating the entire yard three times, uh, you know, this idea of pesticide risk, that can be an IPM practice. If you're only spraying the shady areas for um, for your stilt grass, and then you're using different products, but on a smaller site specific basis. Um, in, in total, that can be less risk than uh, if you're going to do that, that blanket application. So I think just making that point is, is important for people to know that, that using chemicals in, in certain areas, uh, where, again, turf cover is, is the ultimate goal here, right? And you may only need to do it two years. Um, some of these may be longer, you know, than yeah. that side, I think. And, you're and, right. and, you know, I think this is where like large institutional grounds, commercial grounds, uh, campuses, uh, municipal buildings, things, you know, where there's a group of people that are resident that care for it all the time. There really isn't any excuse to not do site specific. It's just let's just blanket the whole place. That's, I think, what we got to start moving away from. And if we don't, somebody's going to make us move away from it, I think especially uh, in New York. But Matt, the challenge, as we've talked about with Cal Bigelow, Carl, a couple of weeks ago was 
Do you, you work a lot with lawn care providers, professional lawn care applicators. Do you see them moving to more site specific applications or do you just see them going out and blanketing and split apping and going that route versus um, site specific stuff? I've talked to some that are trying to get more site specific. Um, I think it depends on, I, I think one thing that, you know, the decision makers, whether they're administrators or whatever, you know, need to start considering is let's not just go with the lowest bid. Let's go with someone who's going to provide what we want. So let's ask, put in that contract, you know, I want site specific management, whatever. And, you know, hopefully there's some people that can do that. I, I, you know, so I don't really blame the applicators or the companies or whatever. They're just, uh, you know, competing. And so I think and no one's demanding. it. Yeah. No one's demanding. I mean, even on our campus, there, we're, we're not, you know, asking that of our, our contract. Well, and, and, uh, and I'll tell you, the thing, one of the greatest innovations I think happened was that buggy that these long guys drive around yeah. these things. They yeah. got granular, they can spot treat. Sometimes they've got a little boom in front. They've got a wand mm -hmm. on it as well. So it looks like they have the equipment uh, to do it in many cases. And I just, I, I'm with you there, you know, that, the way the market is run, the contracts aren't written to mm -hmm. to foster or encourage this type of uh, commercial service. At least it's not been my experience. And I don't know how to help with that because we can't get the co general consumer to understand almost the basic things of how stuff works, yeah. never mind uh, this sort of management. So listen, Matt, thanks for chatting. It's always a highlight of my time when I get to chat with a fellow weed scientist. So appreciate the work that you do and, and taking the time to join us. Uh, appreciate that. Carl? Yep. Th thanks again, Matt, for, for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back again next week with our, our last week of episodes uh, this year. We're going to have one more golf episode on Thursday and, and one more sports uh, episode on Friday. So until then, uh, we'll see you all. Have a good weekend. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web, at cornell.edu.